Welcome to this episode of Ireka and we are going to have a very interesting and a very exciting conversation with uh, Professor Ken Ono. He is a Professor of Mathematics at uh, Emory University and also the Vice President of American Mathematical Society. You might be wondering why he is there in this show, Eureka. He is intimately connected with Ramanujam, the greatest mathematician India has seen in the recent past and how Ramanujam is relevant even today. Keep watching Eureka, but before that, we'll take a very short break. We'll see his profile and then continue this conversation. Professor K. Nono is a passionate and award-winning mathematician who is also a well-known number theorist. He followed in the footsteps of the enigmatic Indian genius Srinivas Ramanujan and explored his mathematical legacy. Presently, he is the Asa Griggs Chandler Professor of Mathematics at Emory University in the USA. He received his PhD from University of California, Los Angeles and considered to be an expert in the theory of integer partitions and modular forms. Ono's contributions include several monographs and over 160 research and popular articles in number theory, combinatorics and algebra. In 2014, Ono and his collaborators Michael Griffin and Ole Warner published a breakthrough result in algebraic number theory that generalized one of Ramanujan's own results. Ono's work, which is based on a pair of equations called Rogers-Ramanujan identities, can be used to easily produce algebraic numbers such as phi, better known as the golden ratio. His work on mock theta functions was selected by Discover magazine as the second best scientific work of the year 2014. Professor Ono has held numerous positions earlier and also serves on the editorial boards of numerous reputed journals specializing in number theory. He has received many awards for his research in number theory, including a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Picard Fellowship and a Sloan Fellowship. He was awarded a Presidential Early Career Award for Science and Engineering by former President of USA Bill Clinton in the year 2000 and he was named the National Science Foundation's Distinguished Teaching Scholar in 2005. Thank you for being with us. It's a very wonderful uh, opportunity to uh, interact with you and then uh, present this show in India. Oh, my Let pleasure. Let me uh, ask you with this question. I mean, uh, right from your uh, school days, perhaps you have been following Ramanujam, right? Yes. It's um, quite a surprise, really. I first learned about Ramanujan as a 10th grader. I was 16 years old. Okay. I was growing up in Baltimore, Maryland, and to be quite frank, the last thing I wanted to be was a mathematician. Last thing you wanted the to be? The last over. thing I wanted to be was a mathematician. Okay. And I almost broke my parents' you know, hearts because my father was a, a, a very well-known mathematician at Johns Hopkins. But in 10th grade, a letter arrived at the house. It was 1984, mm -hmm. a, very, a very delicate letterhead. Mm -hmm. And it was a letter from a woman named Janaki Amal. Janaki Amal. Janaki Amal. Okay. And it was a letter that um, thanked my father for being one of 85 mathematicians around the world for making a contribution to help pay for the bust, a statue of some mathematical hero I'd never heard of. Okay. And my, I brought the letter. I was the one that pulled it out of the mailbox. I gave it to my dad. And a few hours later, my dad tells me this most amazing story about an Indian genius whose ideas have powered not only his career, but the careers of so many distinguished mathematicians that I almost couldn't believe it was true. That, that's a very, very interesting story, I mean, yeah. Yes, and, and there are many layers to why that story matters to me, because as a 16-year-old, and I love my parents, but I have to say, as a 16-year-old, what I heard from my parents over and over again is, you have to get good grades. You have to get high test scores. And I, I kind of rebelled against that. Quite but obviously, all the 15-year-old, 16-year-old kids do would. rebel. Uh, right. Yeah, it's quite, quite expected. And so yeah. it came as a surprise to me that this Indian genius was a two-time college dropout, but his ideas were so important that the mathematicians, in fact, even to this day, such as myself, study his work. And that gave me hope. So, that's, that's so that was a, very, that's a very interesting me. thing. I mean, uh, Ramanujam gave me hope 
even after he died many years after, right? That's right. Manojit had died 60 years before this letter was received. Oh. Yeah. That, that, did you meet uh, Janaki Amal by chance? I never met Janaki. She was, she died, I believe, in 1994 or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, my first trip to India would be a few, year, few years later. After that, okay. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, the way you got inspired by Ramanujam to enter into mathematics, which you kind of hated when you were a 15, 16 year old kid. Well, it was a process. Um, I next heard about Ramanujan uh, in 1987, a few years later, three years later, I was a student at the University of Chicago, uh -huh. and 1987 was the 100th anniversary of Ramanujan's birth. Yeah. And there was a lovely uh, BBC special documentary called Letters from an Indian Clerk. Yeah. yeah. And it was, it, 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 it told the story of Ramanujan, but on film. Mm. and. And so that also gave me further hope as a, as a student at, at, in college. And then as a graduate student at UCLA in 1991, this delightful book called The Man Who Knew Infinity, written by Robert Kennigal, came yep. out. Yep. And I read it with my PhD advisor, and it filled in all, the, all these many details that, uh, that my father didn't know or that the documentary didn't know. And so from then on, I uh, started studying his mathematics and studied, started studying his writings. And so he matters to me because as a student, I needed a role model, one that was meaningful, and his mathematics was beautiful, and you know, almost everything that's been good to me in my life has somehow been related to that. Yeah. A few years ago, I remember that we both were in uh, Madras University Library, and then we were able to actually touch the uh, three books of I still, I still talk about that often. Yeah, we, talk, we held Ramanujan's notebooks, yeah. and despite the fact I had studied copies uh, of these notebooks, it's, it's, it's a very spiritual experience to hold notebooks that are almost 100 years old and to flip through the pages, the pages that Ramanujan wrote on, trying to imagine what he was thinking when he was filling out those filling up those many pages. In fact, yeah. if you flip through these uh, three notebooks, I mean, you can also see the progress in the ideas of Ramanujam, right? I mean, from right. simple question that as a young boy that he was asking in Kumbhagonam to complex question that is emerging slowly That's and right. steadily through his career, right? So it's actually surprising. Um, I like to say that Ramanujan's notebooks are one of the few books that I study and revisit many times each year. Many times each year? Many times each year. Okay. How many books can you study that thoroughly and still get something new out of each new reading? But what's surprising, and this is exactly, you're right, there are three notebooks. The third notebook is basically empty. And the second notebook is an enlarged and expanded and edited version of notebook one. Yeah. So if you study only notebook two, it's not that many pages, but the ideas and the glimpses of how he thought and how he progressed from, I mean, there are even things about magic squares yeah, in these yeah, yeah, notebooks. Yeah, yeah. And then, then there are very, very complicated uh, identities in, in, in analytic number theory towards the end. It's, it's shocking. And I'm not alone. Many of the world's greatest mathematicians have studied Selberg, who is a Fields medalist. The proof of Fermat's last theorem would not have happened without Ramanujan. It's, it's endless. At this point, uh, I want to ask you something like, uh, that was 1920 and this was about 1970s, 50 years, but you thought uh, still uh, it had some validity or only for historical curiosity? Well, at the t even when, Ram when George discovered the notebook in 1976, it seemed like the contents would be, I don't want to say mathematical curiosity because it's not, it's still very deep mathematics. But even at that time, it was deep mathematics, but nobody, I think, could have predicted how important the mathematics in that notebook would be today, now in 2017. It's almost 2018. So you mean to say that uh, it's being studied today? Definitely studied today. So uh, three or four times over the last four or five years, there have been different discoveries related to Ramanujan's mock data functions that have made world news. Uh, if you've heard about this distribution of black holes or if you've heard about something called umbral moonshine, mm -hmm. these, the, these results 
which are important to mathematicians and physicists alike, uh, would have been uh, impossible because they make use of the functions that Ramanujan wrote down in his lost notebook. That's a, that's a very, very interesting point. That brings me to this question of moonshine. Yes. Moonshine, for example, in uh, colloquial English would mean that somebody who is uh, highly drunk, particularly with, uh, you know... Or they're making illegal yeah, 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 alcohol yeah, 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 in yeah, the backyard yeah, with, yeah, a, exactly. with a still, uh, right? And they probably so have you, broken you teeth them? and, yeah. Do you make them? Illegal alcohol? No, I don't. No, no, I don't make uh, illegal... No, 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 I don't. I do not. I really like a beer called um, India Pale Ale. That's my favorite, but I don't drink moonshine. Okay. Moonshine is a... The term moonshine um, is linked to this area of mathematics because moonshine also means speaking nonsense. Okay. And, um, and in fact, if I, if I remember this correctly, the term goes back to, well, one famous use of the term goes back to Rutherford, okay. who thought it would be unlikely that we would ever be able to derive any use from splitting the atom. Oh. Of course, we now know today splitting yeah. the atom is like one of the most fundamental sources of energy. And he said that would be moonshine. Anyone who thinks that you could derive energy from splitting the, the atom is thinking moonshine. Okay. So it is in this context that mathematicians talk about a new field of moonshine. It goes back to the 1970s, okay. where a subject called group theory and a subject called the theory of modular forms, which I've mentioned a little bit briefly, uh, come together in the most unexpected way. So in group theory, this is one of the core areas that we teach um, in abstract mathematics, there was a long program that goes back to the 19th century. In fact, going back to the days of Galois, who okay. was a very uh -huh. distinguished mathematician. And it turns out that these objects called groups can be broken down, but they can only be broken down so far into the fundamental groups, which are called simple groups. Something like, for example, you can break down things into molecules and we exactly. can break down molecules into atoms. So, and that's a, that's a perfect analogy in chemistry. The chemistry, they, they, there's the periodic table of elements and how the elements combine to make molecules follow basic arithmetic rules. Yeah, okay. But unlike chemistry, where we're a bit unsure about where the periodic table ends, right? You hear about elements of atomic weight, 108, 100, right? In mathematics, for well over 100 years, but it was finally completed, mathematicians believed that there would be an analog of the periodic table, a complete list of simple groups that was definitive with no, with no missing element. Any other group would be only a combination of them. Exactly. Uh -huh. And in the early 1980s, this was finally confirmed. It was called the classification of finite simple groups. And in this classification, there was this big group called the monster astronomical, so big that even to this day with modern com computers, it's very difficult to compute with. Okay. But the theory of moonshine said there's a catch, there's a shortcut, there's a detour. You can actually compute with this group if you could prove that glimpses of the calculations were, could be found in these modular forms. That was proven by Richard Borchards. He won the Fields Medal in 1998 for it. And it turns out that moonshine didn't end with Borchard's Fields Medal. We now know that Ramanujan's functions, like these modular forms, also have their own moonshine. And this is the moonshine that people are now discussing in the context of what are called quantum black holes. Quantum black holes. Yes, that's probably not something we want to get into today. But the idea is the theory of string theory, the theory of quantum black holes, is a theory that's been put forth by people like Ed Witten, Strominger and Jeff Harvey, Shamit Kakru and others. I'm somewhat involved in that. And it's the idea of how to bring into correspondence uh, Einstein's theory of relativity with Newton's laws of gravity. Both fundamental theorems, theories that have been useful in their own right, but they have not been brought into correspondence. And that's, gravity is the most powerful force in the universe and we don't understand it. Uh, and uh, perhaps this kind of mathematics would help us make better. That is the hope. Of, that is that's the hope. A, that's, a, that's an interesting point. We'll take a very short break. After the break, we are going to discuss about why or should one necessarily have math phobia. What can we do about it? Keep watching, Eureka. We are going to have a wonderful conversation. We'll take a very short break. Welcome back to Eureka and we are having a very interesting and a very engaging conversation with uh, Professor Ken Ono, who is a professor of mathematics at Emory University 
and also the vice president of American Mathematical Society. We have been talking about Ramanujam. Ramanujam has been your inspiration. Some of the areas that you work are, uh, in a sense, extension of where Ramanujam started. That's right. You are going further, and many of your colleagues are also going further in that particular area. That's a very interesting thing. It's fascinating. Um, I am not Indian. There's very little in my upbringing that 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 is anything like Indian culture. And, and so I come to India probably uh, once every two years, okay. probably do that for, for many years to come. And every visit is, is exciting. I try to visit Ramanujan's hometown. There's a conference every year at Shastra University. Uh, a, a prize called the Shastra Prize is given out every year. And it's, it's one of the highlights of my year when I get to come to India. Okay. Um, so it's very special for me. You have been coming to India and uh, you have been following the footsteps of uh, Ramanujam. Yeah, I've come to India. Yeah, almost every other year I come to India. It's fascinating. Remember, although I'm of Japanese descent, I'm really American. I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, so nothing about my upbringing um, helps me understand Indian culture, much less anything about Ramanujam's background. So despite the fact I've traveled here many times, there's always something new that I learn. Mm -hmm. And probably, like I said, every other year I, I come in December, Shastra University in Kumbakonam, Ramanujan's hometown, holds a, a, a major conference. And at this conference, they give out a, a prize called the Shastra Ramanujan Prize, mm -hmm. awarded to a young mathematician, no, no older than the age of 32, who has made an important contribution. And it's, it's one of my highlights of the year when I get to participate in, in that event. That's, that's fine. Now, uh, leading from this, I mean, uh, in modern times, for example, uh, a lot area of mathematics, that is uh, the contribution of Ramanujam directly and indirectly, as inspiration and directly. Even if you look at the uh, history of mathematics, most people think that uh, it originated in uh, Greece, yeah. Uh, some or other. That's uh, the a contribution Western of... thinking, I should say. Yeah. Uh, I am. A, I, I know. I have some friends, certainly, who are distinguished Indian scientists who know better. So, for example, and, and, and the same is true for all ancient cultures. It's not true that mathematics and science was literally born only out of the West. There's development. Um, some of it parallel. Uh, and it's difficult to uncover. For example, Brahmagupta is a very, uh, should be much more well known in the West, but you know, his contributions to number theory are undeniable. They, they were later, many of his most important discoveries were rediscovered hundreds of years later, yeah. and, 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 and that's surprising. Even the concept of zero can be found on, inscribed on ancient Hindu temples, right? And, and so, History hopefully can correct and fill in the gaps. There are certainly examples in Japan and China of, of discoveries that we attribute to the West. Um, but certainly India has more than its fair share. Very, very. Coming to Ramanujam, yeah. is he only a history or is there a relevance of him even today? Well, there's many answers to that question. So if you work in mathematics, his ideas have powered generations of theoretical mathematicians and theoretical physicists. That is for sure. Now, why does Ramanujan matter to someone who is not a physicist or, say, a mathematician? Well, he matters. If you use your cell phone, I'll tell you he matters. And, and in he fact, matters when you use a cell phone. He matters when you use your cell phone. But that cell phone is nothing but a lot of electronics, right? That's right. So you could argue, and, and, and I think many people make this mistake, they think that computers or cell phones or the internet works better only because of contributions to engineering and, and, and the construction of these devices or the miniaturization of, of, you know, of, of electronics. But let's not forget that ideas and a good idea can be really important. There could be wrong or very slow and inefficient ways of carrying out a calculation. 
So there's a field called graph signal processing okay. that the internet uses, that your cell phone uses. It's all about how to correct or minimize errors in data transmission that is done quickly. And only a few years ago, P.P. Vadyanathan, he's a very distinguished professor at Caltech, discovered that some findings of Ramanujan, which we now call Ramanujan sums, dramatically increase the efficiency and speed for some algorithms that we now use every day. And in 2016, uh, a little over a year ago, he was awarded the Kirchhoff Prize, the highest prize offered by the IEEE. And, 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 and he largely thanked Ramanujan for giving him the idea. So, which means that any viewer who is having a mobile phone... Should thank Ramanujan for that, that's right. Should thank Ramanujan for that. And in fact, there's a very valuable lesson that we can learn in that, which I think is very important to us today. Um, the value of fundamental research, which is not necessarily tied to a goal in mind, are often your best investments. Okay, that, that's I think an uh, important point because people think that uh, people should be uh, engaged more in only applied research. That's right. And not necessarily basic research. That's I think an uh, important point to note that when Ramanujam did this work, perhaps he never even imagined that such kind of uses would occur. Right. right. Well, and in fact, Ramanujan, like Hardy, they loved numbers. They loved properties and number theory. If, they, if we could go back in time and tell them, your ideas will be important for the future, I'm sure they would be laughing about it, yeah. right? They, Hardy was very well known for saying, I want my mathematics to be useless. Yeah. We are utterly useless. And he was quite proud of that because he didn't want his, the, the choice of problems to somehow be spoiled or poisoned in his mind by the need to solve a, a concrete practical problem. This uh, brings me to another uh, point, uh, which uh, whenever that we talk about maths and public, the math phobia. Math phobia. You uh, run into any person, the first thing that they would say that, uh, oh, I don't really like math or I can't do math. I know, I hate that. Mm. So how do I react to that? There are things in life to be afraid of. If you see a cobra on the street, you should be afraid of the cobra. But if you meet someone who's good at math, should you be afraid of the <laughs> subject or the person? No, of course not. But it's easy to see how that would be. <clears throat> For many people, people who don't earn degrees in math or science or engineering, their last experience with mathematics probably was in school, and their memory uh, and their image of mathematics probably involves problem sets, probably involves tests. And you know, who likes that? Yeah. But when it comes to reading literature, reading poetry, you know, if your image of reading books and reading poetry was something like remembering the rules of grammar, who likes that? Yeah, you, that'd yeah, be yeah, weird. Yeah, yeah. So if we had the opportunity, if you're a teacher or a student, you know, try, I would recommend, my advice would be to recognize that math can be as beautiful as art and music. There, people in my field view their profession as if it is an art or if it is like music. Uh -huh. But then also keep in mind that the world in, in which we live is largely measured by the stuff of numbers, the stuff of mathematics. And so I, I would like people to remember that and certainly not be afraid of that. And, and on the other hand, appreciate that, um, that there are people whose lives um, involve this passion for developing the subject further. Coming to Ramanujam, we have uh, very little time. Uh, Ramanujam as a symbol. Why do you think Ramanujam as a symbol is important, relevant, even today? All right, this is a great question. So we've talked about his importance to mathematics, the use of his ideas that help make the world a better place. That's, that's already a great answer. But then I would like to go back to who I was when I was a 16-year-old boy. When I was a 16-year-old boy, and I admitted this to you, I, I was looking for direction. And as a school boy, you, you take courses and you think you're supposed to just get good grades. And, and the mindless pursuit of good grades, you might think is important. And when you're young, you might think that's the only thing that's important. What do we have in Ramanujan? In Ramanujan, we have someone 
where the quality of his character and the quality of his creativity is what matters. That was important to me. But now let's add to that. What if Ramanujan had not been discovered? What if he had lived out his life in South India and his notebooks had never been discovered? I have to say that's, that would be a future that I could not fathom. That is a world I cannot imagine. So why does Ramanujan matter? In addition to the science, it's this lesson. And it's a lesson that talent can be found anywhere. Anywhere. It can often be found in the most humbling of circumstances. So if you're a school teacher or a professor, you know, recognize that that talent is often there and it's kind of an awesome responsibility that you have in, in nurturing that. And I can tell you in my years as a professor, the, the, the students I worry about the most are the ones that I know left my class and I did not reach them. And you have to wonder, maybe none of them would be as great as Ramanujan, but you don't have to be Ramanujan to be important or great. And I think that's why Ramanujan matters. That's, that's I think, a very wonderful point to uh, end the show. Ramanujan matters even today, in terms of science, in terms of technology that we use, even in terms of as an ideal, as a role model for all over the world. Keep watching Reka. We'll come back with another exciting conversation next week. Thank you.